Uh, Tom Harris is on the stage with me here. Tom, of course, is the executive director of the International Climate Science Coalition, and he's got a very important announcement that I think you'll find of interest. Tom. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the International Climate Science Coalition works with people in various countries to help establish national science climate, climate science coalitions. We have very well established uh, coalitions in Australia and New Zealand, and we're also working on establishing one in Canada. Now, on Sunday evening, uh, many of you probably uh, noticed that Professor Richard Lindzen uh, down here and a number of you from the audience also spoke about the need for an organization within the United States uh, through which the voice of American science could be heard in relation to climate change. Well, I think you'll be very happy to hear that uh, we'll be working, the International Climate Science Coalition will be working with various people in the United States to help set, set up a coalition, a climate science coalition of America. I'll say that again, a climate science coalition of America, CSCA. We're very fortunate that Dr. Roy Spencer has accepted an invitation to chair a steering committee. <laughs> Dr. Spencer has accepted an invitation to uh, set up a steering committee to actually work with us to help establish and make the CSCA, the Climate Science Coalition of America, become a reality. From my office in Ottawa, Canada, I'll be helping with the organizational backup until such time as the American Coalition uh, can run their own administration and logistics. So my task this morning is simply to tell you that there is help on the way. There is a Climate Science Coalition of America about to be launched. And if you'd like to be kept up to date on the various details and what we're doing as time goes by, and if perhaps you'd like to become involved in some way, uh, drop me an email. At the back of the various breakout rooms, there'll be brochures of the International Climate Science Coalition, and they will have my email address, and you can see it here on the screen as well. Just drop me a line, and I'll be happy to keep you up to date as we move forward towards this new National Climate Science Coalition in the United States. Thank you very much. That's great news, Tom. Great news. Help from the Canadians. Thank goodness. <laughs> Joe DeLeo. Joe DeLeo has more than three decades of experience as a meteorologist and climatologist. He's currently executive director of ICECAP, an organization, a, a, an organization and a web-based site devoted to climate change issues. He was a professor of meteorology for six years at Linden State College in Vermont first director of meteorology on the Weather Channel. He's a certified consultant meteorologist and fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Here to MC the first uh, part of this day, Joe DeLeo. Thank you very much and thank you, Dan, for your kind words and to uh, everyone from the Heartland for organizing this second ICCC. It is not only 40% bigger, it is many times better, and I thought last year's was excellent. All the keynotes and talks uh, I've been able to attend were excellent. I wish I could have cloned myself and attended all the concurrent sessions. I look forward to the talks being available on the Heartland website. I understand the keynote addresses will be available soon, and then over time, all the talks. I lo look forward to writing about the events, the event at, uh, on IceCap. I'm going through some kind of a withdrawal here for not being able to post for 36 hours. But I want to echo what Myron Ebel said yesterday. The Heartland has a way of making all the co-sponsors, large and small, feel like partners. And I'm happy to hear about Tom's uh, climate initiative. I think there's no import, more important time to work together as a community to keep the cap and trade and tax genies in the bottle. And I want to thank the Heartland for the, allowing me to introduce the next speaker, who I've known for the last six years, a man who has the unique combination of political and media experience and savvy and a strong technical background that may help us navigate through the uh, difficult waters ahead, as so well articulated by Vaclav Klaus and Richard Lindzen on Sunday. John Henry Sununu earned a BS and MS and PhD from MIT in mechanical engineering. From 1968 until 1973, he was Associate Dean of the College of Engineering at Tufts. 
University and Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering. He served on the advisory board of the Technology and Policy Program at MIT from 84 to 89. He served three consecutive terms as governor of my and his home state of New Hampshire starting in 1983. He served as chairman of the Republican Governors Association and in 1987 the National Governors Association. The governor became the first White House Chief of Staff for Bush 41 from 1989 to 1991. John co-hosted CNN's nightly crossfire from March 1992 until February 1998. If that wasn't enough, uh, he has worked in private industry, mainly engineering and finance, for 25 years, and now has taken on the challenge of reviving New Hampshire's Republican Party that's in disarray, uh, finding itself outnumbered from refugees from Taxachusetts. <laughs> His son, uh, John E. Sununu, was New Hampshire's U.S. Senator, but despite the rating as the smartest sen senator in Washington, he lost the last election. A sad day for the state and the country because his vote would have been the one that doomed the stimulus bill. The governor is not a new convert to climate change skepticism. He was a skeptic while chief of staff two decades ago. As I said, I've had the privilege of knowing, working some with John and his son Michael over the last uh, six years. I've learned much from that association. I'm confident that you'll feel the same after today. It's my distinct honor to introduce Governor John Henry Sununu. Thank you very much, Joe. It really is uh, a pleasure, first of all, to be here, and, and most important, uh, to see the great gathering that has taken place here to address what I think is really one of the critical issues uh, of the day. It is, I believe, uh, gathering steam in the right direction, and I think that's what we're here for. We've gathered to bring some reality and some sound science to the ongoing debate on climate change and global warming, and I'm pleased to be amongst uh, this very distinguished gathering of experts who have come to make sure that the world knows that the debate on the science is not over, and that good science is the key to understanding issues as complex as, as this one is, and the key to good policy. This is a very significant event because it will give focus to the false underpinnings of the current international rush to judgment. And it will uh, underscore that the calls for implementation of drastic policies to deal with this rashly proclaimed uh, crisis are wrong. My message today is to make sure we recognize that no matter how effectively we deal with exposing the errors and games behind that agenda, we need to know that the battle will never end because the issue is not really global warming. This global warming crisis is just the latest surrogate for an overarching agenda of anti-growth and anti-development that grew and gathered support in the years after World War II. One of the first issues to be celebrated as a crisis by these reformers was overpopulation. That fad peaked in the 60s and 70s. The Bible of that cult, the population bomb, argued that the battle to feed all of humanity is over. And it claimed we had lost the battle, predicting that in the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people would starve to death. That clearly phony crisis was followed by warnings about global climate change, global cooling was going to lead to an ice age. But the best parallel to the current crusade, the real precursor to the current panic du jour, was the computer model-based alarmism of the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome claimed that global cl economic collapse was imminent because the world would soon run out of some critical resources was a very similar precursor to the current dire warnings. 
It too based its alarms not on any scientific analysis of specific issues, but on a computer model. And like the current call to action, their model was predestined to give the result they wanted. The criticism of the Club of Rome models, uh, Club of Rome models by Resources for the Future clearly applies to the global climate change models. Their predictions of doom are based on the same false approach. The RFF pointed out that the, in, in the Club of Rome models, parameters with a negative impact were programmed to grow nonlinearly, some of them, in fact, exponentially. And while anything that mitigated a negative effect was programmed to grow, if at all, only in discrete and small increments. In each of these false alarms, nature and technology spiked the crisis and the prophecies. The natural cooling period of the 50s and 60s turned into the warming period of the 80s and 90s. And with the help of increased CO2, which as you know is the plant nutrient, instead of mass starvation, we had no problem growing enough food for a rapidly growing population and we continue to find technologies to make efficient use of our critical resources. But the anti-growth and anti-development crowd are a very hardy bunch. They won't give up. As nature switched from global cooling to global warming, so did they. It's quite easy to link virtually all of the principal proponents and, and participants of this overall agenda into a two or three generation mentor, apprentice, mentor, professional family tree. I don't want to go through a specific list of names. There are many of you here who have documented that very well and publicized it. But it is important to understand that without this process of resonating self-adulation, such bad science and ludicrous predictions would long ago have relegated them all to obscurity. Make no mistake, the cast of characters involved in this has expanded a bit, but at the core, there is an unbroken lineage back to those unbelievably wrong, unscientific prognosticators. Their basic method of attack may be the same, but they have certainly refined their operations. They learned from the Club of Rome episode. Since basic hard science is more difficult to bias, they resort again to modeling. And since critics will take the time to examine their assumptions, they make the models big, they make them obscure, and they make them full of complex feedback structures, much too abstract and much too complex to debate in a public forum. That all brings us to what has happened in the last 20 years and where we are today. I think it's worthwhile to review what's gone over during the past two decades to give some perspective and some context to what is taking place right now. <clears throat> First of all, let's summarize what we really know, uh, what we really knew then and what we really know now. In fact, we don't know as much as the media and the public have been led to think we know. Here is what I believe we could include in an absolute fact base. Over long periods of time, climate changes. Over short periods of time, weather changes. There have been relatively long periods of time when the world has been colder than it is now. And there have been relatively long periods of time when the world has been warmer than it is now. CO2 is a trace gas whose present in the presence in the atmosphere can contribute to an increase in the absorption of thermal radiation and the increased use of carbon-based fuels has produced significant increases in the amount of CO2 released to the atmosphere, though that release is certainly dwarfed by natural sources. That's what we know. There's also been a number of identifiable periods of temperature variability in the past century, cooling into the 20s, heating in the 30s and 40s, cooling into the 50s, 60s, and 70s, warming in the 80s and 90s, and cooling in the past decade. Now, we all know that it was the warming period of the late 80s and 90s which gave a context and an opportunity to the alarmists to argue 
that once again we faced a serious calamity. My own involvement with global climate change began in 1989 when I was serving as Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, first President Bush. The year before had seen the staged testimony before the congressional committees that launched into the public consciousness a fear of global warming. In 1989, the pressure for drastic policy changes to respond to such a crisis began. Since some of those had a budget impact, Dick Darman, the director of the Office of Managing Budget, came to see me, and together we sat down with Alan Bromley, the president's science advisor, and we agreed to let some of the leading advocates, some of the leading alarmists come in and discuss the science and the models behind their concerns. In 1989 and 1990, the global climate models were being run on computers that were much less powerful than those we have available today. Models were relatively primitive. They had virtually no detailed inclusion of ocean to atmosphere interactions. And so when the alarmists came to see Alan Bromley and me, and Alan was a great scientist from Yale, serving as science advisor, we asked how they could believe their own results if what they were modeling was a model of climate without any serious or effective inclusion of ocean to air heat and mass transfers. That shortcoming was required of the models because of some time step limitations imposed by the model elements and the characteristics. They tried to argue that the ocean wasn't significant because the culprit was airborne CO2. I pointed out that the top couple of meters of the ocean had a thermal capacity greater than the entire atmosphere, and that the top 100 meters of the ocean were well mixed. They said that they didn't think it was critical to worry about that far away from the atmosphere. When we pointed out that if you did a quick calculation, the heat and mass transfer at the interface were rather significant, and that all this meant that the air-ocean interactions were major drivers, and when we suggested they could confirm this criticality in a simple one-dimensional model, they suggested we didn't appreciate how complex the real issue was. <laughs> they were still determined to use their faulty models to drive policy. And it's only in recent years that the alarmist modelers have been able to include in some detail some significant ocean interactions but the fact is, is they are still extremely far away from being able to handle the reality of nature. Our response in 1989 to their call for policy change was to point out that their model should be supported by good science and that in order to get good science, we would provide a substantial increase in funding for global climate research. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I believe we raised it from about $200 million, $240 million, to $1.5 billion, a sum which at that time was considered rather significant. In today's numbers, it's almost nothing. <laughs> we believed that level would support some serious research to clarify and, and put into real science and, and, and real context the reality of the issues that impact climate change. Over the years, the anti-growth lobby has used climate change, global warming, very effectively. And over the years, they have received even more significant levels of funding. One estimate puts the U.S. contribution to climate research and related environmental and energy issues at about $10 billion a year. And that number is climbing. Unfortunately, the alarmists have effectively captured the funding allocation process. So now an important question to ask is what have we gotten for that investment? In my opinion, surprisingly little. Of course, the computing capacity has been increased and the models have become bigger and more complex and they've been able to include a little bit more detail for some of these critical ocean atmospheric interactions but they're still a long way from modeling detailed phenomena very well. And of course, the most critical phenomena 
are still represented in the computer models by assumed interactions or assumed feedback processes. And thus, and this is absolutely critical for us to, to emphasize as we go through our discussions, the models are virtually predestined the same way that the Club of Rome models predestined a result. They are structured so that if there is any increase in CO2, it almost automatically drives the result they wish. This presentation that I'm uh, going through today is not intended to go through any of the technical details of modeling or of the science of climate. You have experts in here that have done a wonderful job over the last two days and will continue today. However, there are a couple of aspects of the technical details which should, in broad general terms, be understood by those responsible for policy. These issues, in fact, are where we must be diligent in clarifying the science and separating fact from myth. One of these issues is feedback. Feedback in climate systems is a regulating mechanism within the climate system that either dampens or enhances fluctuations, most particularly fluctuations in temperature. If, for example, a climate change which is produced by a slight increase in temperature will itself further increase the temperature, that's positive feedback. But if that temperature increase induced change tends to reduce the increase, it's negative feedback. For the sake of the press, it's often good, and for the sake of the public and policymakers, it's often good to try and give a visualization of what we mean by feedback. I think one way of showing it is, is to talk about what happens to us when we take a shower. We get in the shower, and if the water temperature is exactly what we want and it doesn't fluctuate, feedback has no role. On the other hand, suppose the temperature drifts up a bit and gets hotter. We reach over and either turn the cold up a bit or the hot down a bit to return to our ideal temperature. That's how a negative feedback would stabilize the system. However, consider the shower with the faucets incorrectly marked. The cold faucets marked hot, the hot faucets marked cold. When the water drifts a bit hot, we may turn higher the faucet marked cold, but this is really the hot faucet. And so now the flow gets even hotter. If we try to correct the temperature by turning down the faucet marked hot, which is actually the cold line, the water again gets hotter. The more feedback response there is, the hotter and hotter the flow gets. This is positive feedback. If computer models represent critical phenomena in such a way that all the critical feedback phenomena related to those things which drive temperature is always positive, it is inevitable. With a slight increase in CO2, the result will be excessive heating. There is just now beginning to be some closer examination of a number of the real feedback phenomena critical to model results such as cl uh, cloud climate feedback. Furthermore, I think the world is beginning to recognize that some possibly significant phenomena with strong stabilizing negative feedback have been left out of the models. I think one of the potentially extremely important such effects is the iris effect being studied by Dr. Richard Lindzen at MIT. Another critical issue which deserves more serious dispassionate study is the basic carbon exchange cycle which determines how much CO2 remains in the atmosphere. We need better science to determine which phenomena actually establish the CO2 concentrations at any given time. It is virtually accepted by the alarmist as given that a fixed fraction of anthropologic CO2 remains in the air, even though the initial emission and the remaining CO2 are both extremely small fractions of much larger natural CO2 fluxes. This basic assumption almost makes inevitable the conclusion that CO2 produced by man-made man -made processes is responsible for the, quote, great global warming crisis. Paradoxically, and as you all know, and very important to this erroneous concept of CO2 driving the temperature, there is also a well-accepted data set of global temperatures and CO2 concentrations for the past 400,000 years, which shows it is temperature driving an increase in CO2 
and not CO2 driving temperature. I find it interesting to note how this contrasting set of data is finessed in the alarmist rationalization of the world. In essence, they dismiss it with a self-serving phrase, and that phrase is, quote, while carbon dioxide may have acted as a feedback in the past, it is acting as a forcing in the current climate. No real science, just rhetoric. I've dwelt a bit on these two technical details because I feel that they are among the least effectively understood issues that deserve better scientific study, a better share of the climate research budget for real, unbiased scientific analysis, examination, and data collection, and they are important because they're critical, they are the critical assumptions which virtually predestine the doom and gloom. And I believe they are the ones that if we do a better job of explaining to the press and the policymakers, they will better understand how the global alarmists have had some success in scaring us in the past. Let me get back to the policy debate. In one of the only times that he has ever said anything that was right, Al Gore recently told the American Association for the Advancement of Science, quote, we have a full-blown political struggle to communicate the truth. A full-blown political struggle to communicate the truth. His only problem is that his version of science is more political than true. As I noted earlier, the alarmists have learned well from the past. They saw what motivates policymakers is not necessarily just hard science, but a well-orchestrated symphony of effort. Their approach is well calculated, and it is deliberate. Remember the quote from one of their most outspoken alarmists, quote, we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of the doubts we have. A very good summary of what they have been doing. They have used that strategy to execute an orchestrated agenda over the last two decades. They announce a disaster, they cherry pick some results, they back it up with computer modeling, they proclaim a consensus, they stifle the opposition, they take over the process and control the funding, and then they roll the policymakers. In the past, when they tried some of this on population explosion and, and global starvation or global cooling or their Malthusian vision of a world running out of resources, they were thwarted by nature and technology. Over time, we are confident that nature will thwart them again. Their computer model generated output may give them the result they want for press releases, but nature is not impressed. Nature will eventually do what nature has always done. It will respond in a self-stabilizing manner over the long term, with moderate variability over multi-decade periods, and with occasional significant variability over the short term. But waiting for eventually to prove the alarmists wrong is not our wisest course of action. Unfulfillable ambitions to stifle growth will devastate a world trying to deal with the complexities of economics and stability and the environment and energy. Quality of life depends on access to energy. Noble intentions about a CO2-free source of energy is not sufficient. It is not sufficient, especially if their agenda of, alarming, uh, of eliminating coal as a source and turning their back on nuclear are allowed to be part of our national and international near-term policies. So what is our challenge? What agenda do we define for ourselves if we are to avert a policy disaster? We need to recognize that for the most of the next decade, the real battle will be to win over public opinion and in that way influence policymakers. Unfortunately, standing between us and the public most of the time is the media. And the press seems to have bought the alarmist claims hook, line, and sinker. They thrive on reinforcing the alarms. I'm often asked about the press, and the, quest uh, the question is usually something like, 
is the press biased or ignorant? And my answer is they certainly are. <laughs> we have to try to deal with this as a long-term education process and a long-term lobbying process. And we have to keep working to make the science right and to restore integrity to the data gathering process. This concern about data, I think, is very significant. It is critical that there be real consistency and validity in the observed data which define the state of climate and changes in the state of climate. All of you here are aware of the games played with the data producing the infamous hockey stick plot of temperatures. We know how many of you here have worked hard with good, persistent forensics and analysis to force the correction of that misrepresentation, which was the showpiece in some of the early IPCC reports. That kind of diligent effort and good science is a good example of how we must continue to deal with specific issues. The Worldwide Data Collection Network is also far from world class. There's been a lot written about the far from ideal locations here in the US and how the large loss of stations around the world in recent years makes comparisons across time questionable. We have to make that clear in our debates. The best approach to assure honest consideration of reality in developing policy alternatives would be to establish standards for siting and establish equipment and procedural standards for collecting, processing, and disseminating temperature data. It's the only way to affirm data quality and reliability. But most critically, in order for the science to be right, there has to be broader, less restrictive distribution of research funds. In a sense, we need to work for a fairness doctrine applied to the funding of research and to journal review and publishing of papers. We've all seen and heard of the success of the alarmists, that the alarmists have had in, in taking control of who gets funding, who gets published, who gets acclaimed, and who gets demonized. We've started to address this perversion of the process, and we have begun, but not finished, begun to overcome some of these obstacles. And with nature affirming our belief and confirming our science, I think we all know we'll continue to make headway. But most important, we must work hard to communicate on these issues in terms that can be understood by non-technical individuals. We must remember we're trying to educate a non-technical public and non-technical policymakers. It won't be easy. Nothing worthwhile is ever easy but it is certainly worthwhile to restore honest science and good science, valid science and good data as the basis for public policy. Climate changes, but over time, your good science can explain it. That's our mission, and I thank you for very much for the effort you make in that direction. Thank you very much.